Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, keep your phones off, then if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker during his presentation or after his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming dear Professor Matthew Sperr. Matthew is an assistant professor of accounting at Columbia University. His research interests revolve around the determinants and economic consequences of firm, firm's uh, financial reporting. His research, for example, examined how reporting and auditing regulation affect the firm's bank relationship and uh, industry level competition. Uh, in his research, Professor Brewer uh, used, used a varied uh, methodology, including empirical archival method, structure uh, modeling, and estimations, and fa a failed experiment. His research has been published in top ranking journals. Uh, such as Journal of Accounting Research and the Review of Financial Stock. Now we will start our seminar with Professor Matt. Thanks so much, Mohamed, for this very kind introduction and um, especially for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, let me briefly share my slides. Okay, I hope you can. Yes, okay. So thanks, thanks for the uh, opportunity. And I know this is a, a tough act to follow after Bob Kaplan yesterday, uh, where he talked about uh, the importance of measuring um, ESG-related issues. One other part that often regulators go to is um, transparency and disclosing issues related to this um, and seeing how that works. And this is the realm not necessarily related to ESG, but more broadly uh, related to um, transparency regulation that I do um, quite some research on and that I want to talk about today. Um, so thank you all for, for being here and I'm very much looking forward to any comments, suggestions, uh, questions you may have. I'd be happy to run this as a normal seminar. So just jump in anytime you have any questions, uh, that would be great. So the plan for today, is that I want to talk about a recent project, which is co-authored work with my sister, who is a PhD student at the University of Mannheim and currently visiting um, Chicago. And that's this, this title, uh, that's where this is coming from, uh, the uneven regulation and economic reallocation evidence from transparency regulation. Before getting into this uh, specific project though, I thought, it may be good to briefly review um, you know, where, where the literature is standing there, and I'll make that uh, very, uh, very much centered on um, how I kind of progressed in, in my research there in terms of getting to this question. And so there's lots of more research out there on this, uh, but I'll focus on uh, my progression there. So uh, sorry for that. So uh, Broadly, we're looking at financial reporting regulation and want to understand uh, what do those regulations do? Do we need them? If we need them, how would we want to um, best set them up? And so in that set, uh, in that broader realm, there's lots of studies that investigate how um, forcing disclosure, um, mostly financial reporting disclosure, of course, how that affects capital markets. And in that realm, I also started out with um, two of my co-authors, Catalina and, and Max, uh, where we just studied uh, pretty straightforward how does it, like more disclosure, mandated disclosure affect capital markets. In particular, uh, we looked at private firms and their disclosures and how that affected uh, banks. And what you see there is without a mandate, firms tend to just disclose privately and communicate privately with one or two banks, and um, that's how they try to get their funding. As soon as you had the mandate, the mandate forced them to show their disclosures um, or put them publicly out there. And so multiple banks could look at that. And uh, then on average, you'd see that firms would contract with more banks, uh, everything becomes a bit more competitive in the, in the capital market. So that looks like something that uh, we'd like to see. And in the equity markets, like more liquidity as a result of public disclosure has been documented multiple times. So that may be a, a positive message. Then the question is, okay, why though do the firms then not do this voluntarily? If more compet uh, competition in the public and the capital markets 
is good for them. Why don't they do this voluntarily? Well, the literature gives you several answers. One definitely is that, well, if you make things public, they are not just visible to your capital providers, but they're also visible to your competitors, for example. And so there may be those product market implications of that. Given that I uh, looked into uh, this a bit in various studies and um, indeed what you see, if you force more firms to disclose, you'll see more dynamism, meaning more entry exit, decreased trends, especially uh, of, of those that um, have to disclose and locally at least decreased um, product market concentration. So that would suggest, okay, that, that's the reason why firms may not do that voluntarily. But then we, we'd say, okay, the mandates seem to lead to more competitive product markets and more competitive capital markets. Isn't that great? That's like more competition usually uh, maps into better resource allocation. So that was uh, the next logical thing to look at. And that's what I uh, tried to do in a, um, in a paper which has recently been published in a jar. And what I do there is I compare an industry where you have few firms mandated and an industry where you have multiple firms mandated and see whether you see um, differences in terms of the aggregate performance and aggregate allocative efficiency. Unfortunately, there, the enthusiasm for reporting regulation kind of gets a bit of a, um, yeah, a, a bit of a, a, a reduction there or some warning sign because at least empirically, I can't find much of a strong impact there. And if anything, there's even evidence of some lower growth um, at the aggregate level. So then the question is, why would that be? Um, I conjecture a couple of um, reasons there. One is that this type of competition that we're increasing here through uh, forcing firms to disclose really may lead to Exanta having less incentives to uh, do innovation activity broadly defined, such as uh, spending on finding new markets, spending on introducing new products, et cetera. Because as soon as you've introduced new products or found new profitable markets, you disclose that you found something profitable and then the competition can kick in and reduce your rent. So uh, this ex ante incentive reduction may be uh, playing into this. And that's actually something that uh, in a joint paper with Christian Lotz and Stephen von Haverbaker, I'm seeing some evidence for um, next to that evidence. We're however also seeing that there seems to be some reallocation, some concentration of the innovative activity then among larger firms. And that's now the second um, part that is a big explanation why on aggregate, we may not see necessarily a great improvement uh, with reporting regulation. Well, maybe first and foremost, it results in reallocation uh, rather than um, some kind of Pareto improvements. And that's what this paper that I'll um, spend the next couple of um, minutes on uh, is actually all about. So we're looking into what happens to the location of economic activity. Um, so do we have winners and losers and um, how does that uh, work? So this paper is broadly motivated by the idea that Uneven regulation across countries and industries is are quite uh, ubiquitous. If you think of taxation or banking and labor regulations, they tend to uh, vary quite a bit across countries and industries. And then you tend to have that concern that, well, this may distort the location of economic activity and ultimately even affect the effectiveness of the regulation because you're creating a gap between regulated and unregulated markets or firms and we may see the economic activity shift towards the less regulated markets, and with that ultimately uh, leaving the regulator without the, the effectiveness of the regulation that they wanted to have. This concern is, uh, I'd say, particularly relevant for transparency regulation, not just because transparency regulation is a very popular intervention that is frequently unevenly imposed across industries, countries, um, listing sectors, et cetera, but also because at least economically, the regulation is often um, motivated or justified by the idea of third party effects or externalities that others are also benefiting from it. And why is that something that may um, aggravate the issue here? Well, uh, 
it can lead to a widened gap between regulated and unregulated firms because now we're not just having that regulated firms may be um, getting to uh, have to deal with additional costs, but unregulated ones may also get an immediate benefit from information spillovers, et cetera, really increasing the gap between those. And given that, we, we wonder whether uneven transparency regulation, in our case, forcing the publication of firms' financial information, whether that uh, affects the location of economic activity and reallocation from more to less regulated countries and industries. In a nutshell, we expect that uneven transparency regulation creates these winners and losers and results in this type of reallocation, for example, following concerns uh, voiced by the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. And to examine that, what we do is we'll try to examine both the direct effect of forcing some firms to disclose and the indirect effect of uh, what do these disclosures do to other firms uh, simultaneously. So we'll have to do this uh, because otherwise it's hard to distinguish between those two effects. And so that's going to be our um, key contribution here. And um, to investigate that, we'll exploit two sources of regulatory vari variation, size-based reporting regulations in Europe. I'll talk more about that later. And the staggered implementation of electronic business registers. This is like Edgar being introduced at different, in different countries at different points in time. What we find is if we decompose the net effects into the direct effect of forcing some firms to disclose versus the indirect effect of forcing other firms, um, then we'll see that the, we have quite some evidence for a negative direct impact, consistent with uh, lots of studies that suggest there are proprietary costs, um, et cetera, that leads to uh, firms that are forced to disclose really incurring some um, costs. And we have uh, quite some evidence of positive indirect impacts consistent with uh, the information spillovers helping other firms. And together, this really translates into evidence of reallocation of economic activity, be it production, employment, et cetera, uh, mostly within industries, but also we find some evidence that this spills across industries, across countries. And in particular, this across country uh, spilling of this reallocation can of course lead to um, these regulatory incentives to, for a race to a bottom, because if you as a regulator want to increase transparency in your country, you may just help other countries and um, hurt your own economy. So you, you better don't do this. And so if then we think that transparency regulation is important, and that's a big if that this paper doesn't speak to um, and that the literature hasn't really figured out yet, uh, but if we were to say, look, transparency regulation is important, then um, this reallocation evidence may also imply that we then better coordinate across uh, countries and market segments uh, how we set the regulation. Okay, with this, I now just step back again and um, talk through all these uh, steps individually, uh, starting with the conceptual underpinnings where. As I started out with, transparency regulation tends to be motivated by these third party or externality effects. And that actually makes it hard for empiricists to, to deal with them uh, because now it's not anymore that we can just look at the regulated firm and understand the regulation, but we also need to see what happens if others are regulated. So we need to consider multiple firms and um, and bring all of that together. That's an empirical uh, complication, but also conceptually, of course, then it leads to uh, an ambiguous net impact of transparency regulation, which, uh, for example, uh, Nemet and Rodrigo and Chugada point out in, in their recent uh, JE review and how empirically, at least, um, some of my uh, evident earlier evidence would suggest that this uh, seems to be quite ambiguous. To get to that in more detail, what we can do is briefly think through what a net impact of the regulation on a given company would look like. And um, there I'm borrowing just a, a framework from uh, Tobias Berg and his co-authors um, 
where you can think of the net effect of this uh, company I here being this beta, which really is the combination of this beta one, which is the effect if the company itself is forced to disclose, and all the beta twos, which is the effects of other companies' disclosures on this company. And so uh, we need to worry about both beta one and beta two, and our goal is really to decompose this and, and look at those separately. Um, our expectation is that the beta one, the direct effect of forcing some firms to disclose, is, uh, if anything, negative. Why would we expect this? Well, that would mean that the private benefits of more disclosure fall short of the um, additional costs, for example, proprietary information costs. And why would that be? Well, for, for that, you, you have to understand that the mandate really effectively only forces those firms to disclose that by reviewed preference uh, don't already do it. So they tend to at least privately think that uh, they won't benefit uh, sufficiently from this. Uh, now, of course, it could still be that this is even positive for the forced firms because there may be some uh, things that private contracting and voluntary disclosure cannot uh, sufficiently solve. Um, for example, you may have some commitment issues and insufficient penalties. So there the mandate may even help um, regulated firms themselves, but that um, is theoretically not, uh, not necessarily the first order one I would think of and empirically so far hasn't been the one that got too much support. On the indirect impact, um, we expect the opposite. So that uh, if others are forced to disclose, you as a company, if you can see their disclosures, you can benefit from that. That helps your economic activity because you can better spot where there are nice investment opportunities that you can, uh, for example, exploit. Of course, again, you may think of an alternative here if what's happening then is that everyone is just hurting um, and following kind of fraud firms or neglecting their own private information that may at least lead to uh, less efficiency uh, on the on aggregate, and thus the, this information spillover may not necessarily be positive. Um, but but again, our expectation would be um, that it is also based on prior literature. Now, why would we care about decomposing those signs? Well, knowing those signs helps us a bit to understand what's going on uh, beneath this uh, transparency regulation. Um, and in particular, of course, if both signs are at least weakly positive, so the direct effect is positive, the indirect effect is positive, then we would have a clear case for regulation. If they're both negative, we have a clear case against regulation. Unfortunately, I don't think we're uh, anywhere on this diagonal. Um, what's rather going to happen uh, is that, well, we have this ambiguous effect precisely because the signs will be different. And as I said now, um, our expectation is that we'll be in the world where the direct impact is negative and the indirect impact is positive, which would mean it's not clear whether we should or should not regulate. But what's clear then is that we would expect a relocation of economic activity away from the regulated markets towards the unregulated markets there. And as I said before, this relocation may be particularly uh, strong in in cases of transparency regulation because of that externality dimension. Because if you just think through what happens without an externality and think of labor regulation, we're imposing higher wages in one country than in another, then this higher wages, this direct costs imposed on some firms in a given country, that really is the differential, the gap between the regulated and unregulated ones and um, is the competitive disadvantage of the regulated ones against the unregulated ones. Once we have the externality in addition to that, then it's not just that the regulated ones um, have this negative beta one, for example, but they may even have that the unregulated ones get an additional benefit here through this indirect spillover. And that in absolute terms will lead to uh, a larger wedge between regulated and unregulated markets, leading to even stronger um, reallocation. Now you think uh, you could say, well, this is all um, conceptually uh, potentially quite interesting, um, but does anyone actually care about this? And for that, 
um, there is quite some nice evidence that um, even though just anecdotal, that regulators and uh, academics and companies actually care about these type of uh, costs and reallocation issues. Because uh, there is, for example, this great compendium uh, on accounting regulation in Europe where um, the authors worry that if companies resident in one member state were to be permitted to get away with publishing uninformative accounts, they would have an unfair advantage over companies in other member states, since in a common market, there should be no restrictions on where companies may establish themselves. There would be a tendency for companies to set themselves up in the member state that offered the most favorable financial reporting regime. So what you're seeing here is exactly this concern that you may have a reallocation away from regulated markets in terms of establishments, for example, and you may have this uh, race to the bottom incentive uh, in terms of the regulation. Related to that, there was um, a nice article in a German news a newspaper uh, when Germany strongly increased its enforcement of these uh, financial statement disclosure requirements. I'm sorry that I just have this in German here, so you have to take uh, my word for uh, this uh, loose translation that I'll give you now. But what, what's happening here is that you have companies complaining that now that they have to disclose, their employees, their customers, their suppliers can see all their information and also their competitors, and they worry that that hurts them. Uh, so that's the typical, okay, we, we may incur proprietary costs through that. The nice addition is that then the companies go on to complain that, look, we have to do all of this, but other producers that produce the same thing, but are located in Italy, for example, they don't have to do that much of this. So this really puts us at a competitive disadvantage. And here you see this um, cross country comparison and reallocation that they really uh, tend to think that uh, the transparency is an issue that uh, potentially can lead to some reallocative effects here. Okay, now, how do we get go about trying to study this? As I said, this is reasonably difficult because now we can't just look at one firm and whether it's regulated or not, but we have to consider also the effects of other firms being regulated. What we do is we'll just aggregate everything up to the uh, country industry level and then see whether there's some uneven regulation across the country industries and try to understand, uh, decompose this uh, effect. So what I show you here is that um, we can of course take this firm level, um, this firm level equation from before and just aggregate it up so that this beta now is not the net effect at the country level or at the firm level, but at let's say the country industry level, manufacturing industry in Germany. Um, then we still have that, we have this beta one and beta two where beta one captures um, the direct effect uh, and beta two captures the indirect effect. As regulations, so that we have variation in the share of regulated firms in that industry and share of regulated firms in other industries, we'll use uh, the accounting directives in Europe where one, they require size-based disclosure requirements. Um, and two, they at some point also ask the company uh, the countries to introduce um, business registers, especially electronic business registers, just as the uh, SEC Edgar in, uh, in the US. And so those uh, two types of variations will be used to have these T, these treatment variations for firms in that industry and related industries. And in particular, to identify this direct impact, what we use is the share of regulated firms in a given focal industry. That's this T bar, TI bar that we're having here. Uh, to then disentangle the um, indirect effect, what we need to control for or also include there is, in essence, the share of regulated firms in related country industries, including the own country industry. How can we define relatedness? Well, that's where we use uh, input and output matrices. And that's one of the first important reasons why we're doing this at the uh, country industry level, because at that level, unlike on the firm level, we actually have pretty nice data on who's related to whom. And that's, gonna, that's helping us 
in terms of um, providing this decomposition into the ones that are forced to disclose in the industry itself and the, the related firms that are forced to disclose. Another big reason for doing this analysis at the country industry level is that at that level, we really have the first order measures of economic activity, be it production, value added, employment, um, capital formation, that regulators really care about. Because at that level, they track this quite nicely and report this um, quite nicely. And that's also then the level that we can use as, um, as our outcomes. Now, to just understand the uh, regulatory variation a bit more, I'll briefly talk about the um, basic institutional features of the exemption thresholds or the financial reporting regulation in Europe. In Europe, by the financial reporting regulation of the EU, uh, firms both publicly listed and private limited liability firms have to disclose um, audited financial statements. To reduce the burden on smaller private firms, though, the regulation allows countries to put in place some exemption thresholds uh, below which firms don't have to comply with the full reporting and auditing requirements. And the typical exemption thresholds relate to total assets, sales, and employees, and tend to be around 4 million in total assets, 8 million in sales, and uh, 50 employees. Uh, but those thresholds vary across time and vary across countries. Importantly, if, then a if, if in a given country, a firm is below these thresholds, they are allowed to only provide highly abbreviated financial statements, often only an abbreviated balance sheet with um, a bit of a management report, but not much more uh, information there. And that provides us with a nice uh, bit of variation where we're having this threshold-based variation in the extent of uh, the transparency regulation at the country industry level because the thresholds vary across countries and a given threshold, of course, affects a manufacturing industry differently than a service industry, depending on their relative size uh, distributions. Now, briefly, to give you an Im impression of what this variation captures, here I have an example of um, a private company in the UK that in 2014 was providing abbreviated accounts because it was still below the size thresholds of the UK. And those abbreviated accounts, you see the cover page of the, um, the filing here, really just has the, an abbreviated balance sheet and a bit of um, abbreviated notes, one or two pages, that's it. The next year, the same company is above the thresholds and so has to report the full amount. And what you then see is that you get a strategic report, you get a profit and loss account, you get a full balance sheet, and you get several pages of notes. So substantially more information that the regulation um, requires this company now to publish. So how do we use that institutional detail to uh, get to these beta ones and beta two, so the direct and the indirect effect of transparency regulation. Well, we use the following design where we have as an outcome, let's say production in Germany, in the manufacturing industry. And then we have uh, this reporting, which is the share of firms in the manufacturing industry in Germany that exceed the uh, thresholds, the reporting thresholds and uh, to get to the other related uh, firms and their reporting mandates, we have this supplier or customer reporting, uh, which is just the share of input or output weighted um, linkages um, and of, of the companies that are in other country industries, how many of them are above the threshold there. So that's our relatedness measure to get to how many other related um, firms are forced to report. Importantly, um, but this is more a technical note, but of course you, you worry that, well, 
Um, if you're just measuring how many firms are about the thresholds, then there's lots of omitted variables and, and reverse causality. You could have that there's just a large company that or many large companies that produce a lot. That's why production is high, and that's why you'll see a high reporting share. Um, that is a big worry, uh, which, however, we can address by using uh, a simulated instruments approach, which was pioneered by Curry and Gruber in the JPE 1996 and was used now a couple of times. And the basic idea there is just to not use the actual firm size distribution in each and every country industry, but use a, uh, a representative distribution for each industry, and that gets rid of several of those issues you would, um, you would have there. Now, what do we see? So here's the first um, regression results and the tables that uh, I wanna talk through. And the first thing that we're doing here is simply regressing value added at the country industry level on uh, reporting, which is just the share of firms that are above the uh, reporting thresholds. If we're just running that, we find that there's uh, no significant effect. If anything, there's a slightly negative um, association here, consistent with, for example, um, the My Job Market paper, where I'm, I'm showing that on net, we don't see much. Why is this net? Well, because here we're really just using the share of firms that are forced to report in a given industry without controlling for the share of related firms. And so this is more the net effect here. Once we decompose this by, for example, controlling for the supplier or customer reporting, so input and output linkages based reporting, we'll see that the direct effect here gets substantially larger and significantly negative, while the indirect effect of other firms, your suppliers having to report, um, really is strongly positive here. And the same thing you see if we're using uh, these customer reporting linkages. So this suggests that the um, insignificant net effect really masks quite a bit of reallocation in terms of you losing if you have to report or you gaining if others are uh, reporting. Notably, this holds for both outputs like production, value added here, and inputs, employment, capital formation, et cetera. Also, that's a nice feature. Um, this holds for the number of establishments. And this is now gets very close to what the concern was that I showed you before, that, well, if in the EU you're requiring more disclosure in one country, the companies can just uh, put their establishments into other countries. Here we're seeing again on net, this is just slightly negative. But once we're uh, separating those out, you have this strong positive effect of others reporting, and then you uh, have more establishment in a given country industry, versus uh, if in the country industry there's lots of more firms that have to report themselves, then this is um, negative. Here. Now, just to help understand the, the magnitudes here a bit, because you would see from this and the prior table that this supplier and customer reporting always tends to have a higher coefficient than the, the direct effect. So you could say, well, the spillovers are more important than the direct effect. So on that, we should be good. But on that, at least in a given industry, we don't seem to have a positive effect. Well, this comes from these two um, shares, of course, relating to a different number of firms, because on average, in a given country industry, we have about 11,000 uh, firms, while we have double the number of firms in all the related supplier and customer industries throughout all Europe. So to make those uh, comparable, what you would want to do as a back of the envelope calculation is always divide the, the supplier or customer one by two, and if we do this here, then the coefficient here is 0.5, which is lower than this 0.6 or 7 um, on the beta 1 here. And that explains why on net this is um, usually negative, though clearly not significant. So we've seen reallocation in turn, or this negative direct effect and positive indirect effects for production and inputs, and now even the establishments. What we can do next is 
get close to the this question of okay, what happens um, if we have uneven regulation, meaning if our industry is more regulated than its related industries in other countries. And to get that at that, what we're simply doing is we're taking this share of firms that have to report in this given industry, and we deduct the share of firms that have to report in related industries. So this is really now the differential. How much more do you have to report here um, than in, in other countries and industries? And there we see throughout the, um, the table for all these outcomes that it's significantly negative if in this country industry, in the German industry, manufacturing industry, we force 10% more firms to disclose. Well, value added relative to the others, uh, is going down by 18%. Why that much? Well, because it's not just that you impose a direct cost on that industry, but also because other industries and countries are actually benefiting from uh, the information spillover stand. Uh, one additional nice piece I wanna highlight here is if you look at um, the inputs, the number of employees and the gross capital formation, you see that this reallocation effect is really strongest for capital formation um, compared to uh, employees. And that makes a lot of sense because capital is way more mobile than employees. Yes, it could be that um, there's more produ less production in the given industry and less employees needed, but then the employees, because they're not so mobile, they tend to rather take a, uh, a hit in the wages rather than um, reallocating to a different country. And so that's why usually we see that the employees number doesn't drop that much as the uh, gross capital formation. So this suggests now, well, we have a direct negative effect, we have a positive indirect effect, and this can lead to quite some reallocation. Now the question is, where do we reallocate to? Is this all just happening within a given country or does that even spill across country borders? Because if it's all in a given country, then uh, we may not worry too much about this unless we have specific um, industries lobbying a, a given country level regulator. So next, what we do is we split this um, indirect customer reporting part into domestic firms and um, foreign firms or industries. And what we see is clearly uh, the spillovers are strongest domestically because there it's easiest to relocate. You're still reasonably close. You're still in the same otherwise regulatory environment. So more information spillovers and reallocation happens uh, domestically, but also quite some reallocation happens across uh, the boundary, boundaries of uh, con con countries' borders. And so that then is the piece that may give rise to these uh, race to the bottom incentives and the potential um, concern or maybe a reason for coordination. Now, we show this with this first set of um, regula regulatory variation, which is based on those thresholds. And to triangulate our results, what we do is we look into this alternative uh, variation in terms of transparency regulation, which is coming from electronic business registers. So the EU at some point said, not only do you have to report these financial statements if you're above a given threshold, uh, we also want to make the access to those reports as easily uh, as possible. And so through that, they said, well, we want to have electronic business registers in particular until 1st of January 20, uh, 2007, all European countries should have such an electronic business re register. As is usual in Europe, you already had some countries who had an uh, electronic register to begin with. You had some who were late to implement this. Um, and so the, that's giving us some staggering in which of the countries already have this or not. And so with that, we can run a more familiar uh, difference in differences design, which helps hopefully validating and triangulating what we've been doing before with this uh, threshold-based variation. Just to give you a stark um, example, again, this is similar to the staggered adoption in, of Edgar in the US, but 
uh, stark example you have with uh, the and a not completely fair um, example is for the German Bundesanzeiger, which is the register where companies had to file this in before. So historically, and I have a very old snapshot here, it, it was just a newspaper that was really printed and sent out. And then um, as soon as they put in place the electronic business register, you could access it online easily, uh, just as you can do uh, with the SEC uh, ADCA website in the US, for example. Okay, so how do we use that type of variation? Well, the, the general regression will look very similar, of course, because we still have, let's say the production of the uh, manufacturing industry in Germany here on the left-hand side, and then regress that on the focal industries um, regulation versus the related industries regulation. And here um, to get the direct effect, what we're using is whether that country, whether Germany at the time had a register in place or not. And to get to this supplier or customer register um, piece there, we're looking whether the related, uh, so it's input and output share weighted um, country industry linkages, whether they had uh, a register at the time or not. Now, what we see is that across the board here, again, the direct effect is negative and the indirect effect is positive. The uh, overall statistical significance here is sometimes slightly weaker than before because we're really not having that much country industry specific variation here. Um, and so that is reducing that otherwise in terms of uh, magnitudes, once you um, kind of break down the other magnitudes to a reasonable within standard deviation, um, they are very comparable. And uh, we have the same pattern again, negative direct effects, positive indirect effect, also the same pattern that the number of employees is not as much as affected as the capital uh, reallocation. Now, after this, what we want to do to additionally triangulate and also further our results a bit to uh, what we do is run a couple of cross-sectional results to understand which industries or which countries are really affected by this. Um, and that's actually what I'll do on the next slide. On this slide, first, I want to tell you, of course, that um, one of the benefits of using this more traditional definitive design is that now, unlike for the first setting here, we can plot something like uh, the dynamics of the treatment effect. And what we see is that there's little evidence of any um, diverging trends in the pre-period. And then there is a pretty stable uh, treatment effect post the treatment. And that gives us some comfort that um, the effects that we're estimating here may be plausibly related to the regulation itself and not uh, to other events. Um, now, to better understand uh, which industry is affected and which country is affected, we're having these cross-sectional results where and the first thing we look at and the main one that I'm reporting here only is um, whether an industry is producing tradable goods or non-tradable goods. What's the idea behind that? Well, the idea is if you're a non-tradable industry, meaning you're producing and selling ice cream locally because you're the, the ice cream shop there, you can uh, be in another place because you have to be locally there to do your sales. Uh, so any kind of a service, uh, sectors tend to be related to that. So those, even if they get hurt a bit by disclosure, they will not be that easily relocating to a different country to then uh, do their job there because they think, okay, my market is here. I need to be here locally. Uh, otherwise I can't serve that market. While tradable industries, they can produce wherever they are and then ship their goods uh, to the respective markets where uh, the customers are. And so for those, we should expect a way larger uh, possibility to relocate to places where it's cheap to produce and then just shipping their uh, goods to, to the markets where there seems to be a sufficient demand. Also, 
uh, you can have those, uh, let's say the Italian producers, if they now see how profitable it is for Germans to produce and sell in their local markets, if this is a tradable industry, they can just ship their goods there and try to enter that market without having to, to operate there. And so this really suggests that we should see the main effect uh, for the tradable ones. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. For non-tradable industries, the effect is quite a bit uh, weaker. Similarly, we have this for homogenous versus uh, differentiated goods. So the reallocation is easiest if you have homogenous goods, because then you just need to know where a, a good market is, and then you can ship there because it's the same good anyways. While if you have differentiated producers, even if you know that they are in a profitable market, you may not be able to uh, copy their differentiated good that easily. Now that's on the dimension of which type of industries are most affected. Um, the next part of that is which countries may uh, be most affected by that. And here we're seeing that the spillovers are most pronounced if you're geographically close, which makes a lot of sense because yes, the information may travel uh, quite far now because everyone has the internet, but it's still going to be costly to ship your goods over a longer distance. So most likely the, the greatest potential for reallocation you'll have if there is a neighboring country which is pretty close to uh, the current location of the reporting uh, firms. So a geographical uh, closeness is important and also linguistic closeness where we're seeing, okay, if you have a similar language, then this reallocation happens more than if you have dissimilar languages, uh, which would be consistent uh, with this all really flowing through the financial disclosures because you have to be able to read those statements in the local language because usually they are not produced in English. So then uh, you have some benefits if, like if French producers are disclosing something, the Belgian ones may better understand it than the German ones. And uh, so that, that is how the uh, linguistic differences come in there and also moderate that and provide some evidence that I would interpret as uh, supportive of um, all these effects that we're, or all these associations that we're documenting running through um, the actual disclosure of uh, firms' financial information. Now, of course, we'll have lots of uh, supplemental results that we have to uh, have to go through and, and work in, work through in the in the paper but for the sake of this talk uh, this is not going to be all that interesting so I'll I'll just briefly talk about the main piece which is of course that to interpret the uh, associations that I've been showing you so far in, in any way causally we'll have to have, um, that the regulation or the regulatory variation we're using is plausibly exogenous. And on that end, we're providing some evidence to hopefully support the, those assumptions. For one, we're showing that, for example, the reporting exposure, which is the, the threshold-based variation we use initially, that this one is not correlated with any kind of uh, firm size differences anymore, so that this reverse causality issue, for example, is, is not going on. Uh, similarly, the register exposure, we're looking into what explains the timing, and we don't find much that uh, would explain the differential timing there. And we also, as I showed you before, we're, we're plotting those dynamics where at least uh, in the pre-period, it doesn't look like there's clear evidence of a differential uh, trend, which provides some comfort, but definitely, of course, is no proof. And there's lots of more of robustness, which are things that I'll skip for the sake of this talk. And so I'll uh, get to uh, wrapping this up with a discussion of what does this mean and, and how, yeah, what, what can we take away from this? So what we find is quite some evidence of a negative direct and a positive indirect impact. And that is consistent with the concerns uh, voiced by regulators and uh, legal scholars, for example, also in the US, that you have this reallocation away from regulated markets towards unregulated markets. And an important one that is also related to this piece and, and is coming out of this is uh, that 
we need to be cautious that externalities per se do not justify the regulation. They can be a, a justification for regulation, but per se they are not necessarily. And this is where um, lots of the prior literature shows evidence of spillovers where they're just looking at the firms that don't have to disclose and see how they benefit from other firms' disclosures. And yes, they'll, they'll benefit and that's great, but we don't then understand of where do the benefits come from and is this for free or does anyone have to pay for that? And by us looking at this jointly, the direct and indirect effect, we see well that the indirect effect this positive spillover really seems to be more a reallocation because uh, the, those that have to disclose, they're paying for that. And then the others are getting the benefit from that. So it's not really looking like a burrito improvement or anything uh, along those lines, but more, uh, okay, where the regulation takes from some and gives to others. Another thing that is important to discuss, of course, is um, what a plausible mechanism how this all works because now this is of course a, like i said before the benefits of this high aggregation level that we're having in our analysis is that we're looking at a level that regulators care about and we have a level where we can nicely say who's related to whom because that's what we can do at the in industry and country level but we're losing the uh, fineness of understanding how individual companies may uh, be affected by these reports and uh, by these forces and how they may react there. Luckily, we can rely on a wealth of prior evidence. So there's lots in the literature that is consistent with what we're uh, showing here. But often enough, they looked at either just the direct effect or the indirect effect and didn't necessarily connect those two together. Um, here, for example, on the proprietary uh, costs, there's ample evidence, and I'm really just here citing uh, things in our immediate setting. There's, of course, way more uh, even in, in the US literature there, but Darren uh, Bernard has lots of papers um, and great papers in, in the German setting there uh, and European setting where he shows, okay, given that firms have to disclose more above the thresholds, many firms, especially those that seem to have proprietary information concerns, try to avoid the thresholds. So all of that is consistent with some distortions due to this direct impact of the regulation. And then there's a wealth of um, evidence on this positive indirect impact where we, we know that if some firms are disclosing more others that are related, get better financing terms, or if public firms disclose more, private firms know better how to invest. Um, there's evidence on better entry decisions and expert decisions. So all of that is looking isolatedly at uh, what happens to firms that see other firms' disclosures. And that is very consistent with our indirect uh, positive effect. There, is a couple of, there are a couple of papers, and it's a, it's a growing literature now, uh, but still nascent uh, that really looks at reallocation in so far as they're looking at both the direct and indirect impact um, at the same point in time. We have survey evidence by uh, Mike Minnis and Nemet Shroff, in, especially in, in our European setting, which is quite nice because they're, they're asking the companies, do you like your own mandates? Do you like other firms' mandates? And there the firms clearly say, well, I don't want to report, but I like that I see the other ones because that helps me do my business, make my business decisions. Um, in a recent paper with, again, my co-authors, Katerina and Max, we're also looking at that uh, with disclosure as an outcome. So not economic activity, but disclosure. And there we're seeing if some firms are forced to disclose more, others, unregulated ones, dial back on their voluntary disclosure and in essence free ride on this so there you're also reallocating who has to take the cost of disclosure um, across different segments and then there's a nice paper by uh, Thomas Rauta at Chicago who in his job market paper examines what happens if you have uh, extraction uh, the industries that have to disclose um, to reduce their briberies etc and if we do this disclosure just on a segment of uh, or a part of that um, segment, then overall, it really doesn't change much because yes, those that have to disclose, they do less bribery and less get, uh, get less of the contracts, but that all just gets reallocated to the, the few firms that are not subject to that regulation and so take over this. And this is 
where I, th I think we are seeing more and more the caveats of transparency regulation, especially if it's unevenly applied. Um, because yes, it's often seen as a cheap a remedy and something that everyone can agree on because disclosure and transparency sounds great, but the promise is can be quite limited in so far as um, it often just reallocates who does that activity and not necessarily leads to overall improvements in particular if we're just having uh, a certain segment regulated there. So with that, I'd like to conclude here and uh, say that um, I hope you've you take away that we've shown some evidence on uh, that uneven transparency regulation can have quite some notable reallocative effects. Clearly those effects are most strongly pronounced within industries and countries. So this is offsetting at, at a higher level, but it's also spilling across uh, country boundaries. And at that level, then of course, we get into issues that there may be these potential uh, incentives for a race to the bottom in terms of transparency standards and their coordination may be called for just as now um, the regulators are trying to coordinate the taxation across countries because over years we just had this unhealthy race to the bottom there. Now um, something like that for transparency regulation, if we think transparency regulation is desirable, uh, would be needed too. Actually, the EU also tries to do this a bit. So the threshold variation that we're using is a limited in some part because they set maximum exemption thresholds. So they seem to be aware that some kind of uh, coordination is needed, but this uh, I think is something that just uh, comes out even strong more strongly out of this paper, hopefully. And in terms of the contribution, we really think that uh, by being some of the first that decompose the net impact into the direct and indirect impact um, simultaneously, uh, we can really better understand also where does the indirect effect come from, because it's not free, it's coming from imposing a cost on some others, and so really just reallocating economic activity from some to others, and this leads us to uh, study more the distributional impact of the regulation, which to me is a uh, is a great avenue um, to, to go uh, to in, in the future for any uh, researchers out there, because again, regulation doesn't seem to primarily make everything better or worse, but tends to reallocate. And so we wanna understand uh, who's winning and who's losing. Okay, with that, I'd be um, through my talk here. So I'd be happy to take any comments, questions. I see there's, there was some activity potentially in the uh, thread. Uh, chat, so please uh, feel free to unmute and uh, ask me anything. Thank you very much, dear Professor Matthews, for your contribution and your effort. It's really an excellent presentation and excellent people. Uh, now, uh, if anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask you to... If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask you which. Uh, Richard, you have any question? Hello. Well, uh, thank you for, uh, for for our allowing this possibility, Mohamed, and thank you, Matthias, for an excellent presentation. Really grateful to join in and listen. The question that I had was more to the forming of cartel and hitting price agreements um, under. Uh, but but I think more of your presentation already covered it. Of gave gave a good good um, motivation to what might happen in some more regulated industries like the pharmaceutical one. Uh, and and the second question could be what I've seen in in APEC specific markets is that the distribution of uh, private corporates is relatively narrow. And then we have something um, that's called tunneling or popping to reallocate. Uh, so does your research also include um, those ways of, 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 of funneling? Is that, because it seems to work pretty well uh, for, 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 for society as a whole. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Richard, for, for those uh, great questions. Um, so on the, on the first part, in terms of um, also the, the collusion. So this is definitely another thing that uh, can happen with respect to disclosure. 
um, there. I have to clearly say I'm not the, the greatest expert on that, but my colleague, uh, Thomas Bobo, has a great paper on um, how disclosure can actually also be used as a collusion uh, device. So that's a recent paper in the account, accounting uh, Journal of Accounting Research that I highly uh, recommend. Um, so that's where like companies, if you if they disclose more, because they're in, in the US, the, the securities regulators think it's great to have more disclosure to investors. And then the companies use this excuse to disclose more to really coordinate on prices, et cetera, through, um, through the disclosed information, because now uh, the antitrust cannot come and say, you, you're not allowed to do that because the SEC as a securities regulator tells them you have to do this. So that's, uh, that's where um, kind of regulators that aren't quite well aligned can lead to these, uh, these issues. Uh, in, in this particular case here, um, in, in, my, uh, in, in the study here with my, uh, my sister, I, I would say the main thing that's really happening is not so much that they then collude, but more see, okay, where is a profitable market? And so I go there. Um, but that then uh, in terms of antitrust still leads to some, uh, some potential conflicts in uh, going forward because uh, in, in the study with Christian and on the innovation activity, we're really seeing that um, the ones that are losing out tend to be the smaller companies and the ones that are winning out are the bigger ones. Why? Because the bigger ones, they disclose anyways. So they are not affected that much by this type of regulation. And they can hide lots of stuff because they're so big, so they have so many segments. It's it's not so informative compared to one segment little uh, company that's just producing and and selling in one market. So the smaller ones tend to lose out, and they get bought out, or their market gets gets captured by um, by the larger ones. And so we're seeing this type of uh, alloc reallocation. Which then ultimately, of course, um, I started out saying, look, disclosure seems to be reducing product market concentration in local markets, but it may lead to concentration at the aggregate because now a few big companies are really buying off the, those smaller ones as soon as they see them. So that's uh, actually a cost of, of disclosure that would be worth uh, studying more there and could then rise to the issue of uh, greater uh, antitrust issues. Yeah. Thank you. It's very insightful. Thanks. Yeah, are there another question? If anyone has any questions, you can open your mic uh, and ask your question. If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. I'm glad I was so clear in my presentation. Uh, can you have you can yeah sorry my camera is not on um okay so uh, I, i'm 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 doing I'm, I'm, i was listening very carefully it was thank you so much it was very nice presentation very informative yes. um so uh, so I'm, I'm just thinking just trying to make sense of things and and, and because you have spent so much time on this so um so if, if I'm a regulator sitting in a emerging uh, sort of economy and where the regulations are already weak or things are not working, uh, a, a, you know, in, in terms of stronger um, sort of institutional uh, strength. Um, so how would I see this as, as a message that, you know, if you are not regulated uh, or maybe there's an opportunity here for us I just want to hear your opinion. Like, what what do you think about such situations? No, that's 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 a great question. So, and and obviously now I have to uh, start speculating here because this is outside of of our sample, which is um, mainly in in, in Europe. Um, but it's exactly true that I think um, it should be a cautionary tale, um, also for. For than other um, other countries, especially if we're thinking about uh, developing countries and how they should think of how to best implement certain institutional uh, arrangements, because we have, uh, given that we have lots of research um, showing that more disclosure is great for capital markets for the liquidity of them. I think there is the tendency of international institutions then uh, to to say, okay, 
look, if you want to become a, a developed country, what you have to do is adopt those institutions too and uh, be more transparent in, in everything you do. And it's not so clear that this greater mandatory transparency, especially in terms of the financials, is really necessary um, for, for countries to, to make progress. There are these alternative ways of allocating resources based on relationships, based on private information that are also uh, working and may actually be things that um, are better for, for countries which otherwise have uh, firms that would be uh, too weak to compete with bigger companies elsewhere. Because if then you have relatively weak companies locally and make them disclose, then it could be that yeah, big international corporations see this as a, a, a good market to invest in and buy off that company or uh, compete with that company in that market. And that way uh, may actually weaken the local economy, at least the local entrepreneurship there. So um, I think that that's, how far I would go out on the on the limb there. Of course, I'm I I'm far from prescribing more or less transparency here, but definitely given that I see the general um, um, bias towards for uh, arguing for more transparency, especially with respect to financial reporting relations, I'd say uh, look, there's always the voluntary uh, mechanism that if firms really think they benefit from it, they can do it voluntarily. And that's how usually it first emerged in many countries, even in the US where we, uh, in, in related research, I have some evidence that before any mandates, the firms that really needed it, they disclosed. And the others just don't say anything because they don't want to have widespread investors anyways. And so it's not clear that a mandate is, is always uh, the way to go there. And then in that sense, it's not clear that kind of in, imposing a costly regulation on, on a, a developing country here would really bring the benefits that um, their proponents may, may be uh, looking for. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, there, are, there, are, there is another question. If anyone has any question, you can open your mic and ask your question. <clears throat> If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your coach. You can. Yeah, you have any yes. questions? Uh, there are the problems of uh, political system. As you know, this uh, whole country, they have different uh, political systems. Unfortunately, I couldn't really understand you if you would want to try that again. Otherwise, I heard something about different political systems, but uh, unfortunately, not much more. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me uh, let me say, okay, uh, I, I assume now that the following is, is the question. Uh, so uh, the one different countries have different political systems that have that are determinants for the differences in in the regulations that we may be using and then um, that can have implications for our empirical uh, design and, and, and results and the second part of that is okay, how would we think about it now um, which political system should actually um, use use what kind of uh, uh, disclosure regime um, to the first one it's definitely true that um, precisely because some countries kind of have different political systems and economic systems, some worry more about this type of disclosure or not. So um, for example, you have systems that are very centrally governed uh, and they tend to like lots of disclosure of all firms, even private firms, because they then can better steer the economy because you have some central planner in essence. So in uh, 
not to not to say that the, uh, France has a central planner, but they have quite some uh, extensive disclosure mandates down to very small firms because they generally like to, I think, uh, for administrative purposes, see a lot of what companies are doing. And uh, that, that's been uh, several countries in the east of Europe had this, um, I think, also with, with the, um, the prior history they, they came from political systems. And so that, that's something that, um, one, um, is, is definitely true in our, uh, in our empirical design. We'll try to address this so that this is not influencing our results because we're controlling for the same country and just looking within the same country. Um, but now going to what are the implications? Yes, definitely, like you'll, um, that's where this one size fits all will definitely not work. Um, because you have different systems, they have different priorities for what they like, whether they, they care about concentration in their markets or whether they care more about having a good idea of uh, how the economy is doing and you want to see every individual firm's reports. And so depending on how they like to steer the economy and whether they give it more to the market versus want to be more active there, then you'll see more regulation of this type or uh, leave it more to... Um, to the market to figure that out. I'll go into your question, sorry. Are there another question? If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Thank you very much, dear Professor Matthias, for your contribution and your effort. Uh, it's really an excellent presentation and excellent uh, paper. Thank you very much. And that's all that remains for me uh, to say. Uh, thank you, everyone that joined us. And I thank you very much for taking the time out to present to us today, dear Professor Matthias. It's been really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mohamed. And thanks, everyone, for coming and asking uh, your great questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you soon in Egypt. See you there.